you haven't already rated and reviewed the Single Tracks podcast in your podcast app, now's the time to do it. We're randomly selecting listener reviews to read on the show, and if we choose yours, you'll get a free Single Tracks hat in the mail. Hit pause right now, write a quick review, and then listen to future episodes to find out if you won yourself a hat. Happy trails. Hey everybody, welcome to the Single Tracks podcast. My name is Jeff, and today my guest is Leo Wilcox. Lael started biking in 2008 at age 20 with an around-the-world bike trip that took her through more than 30 countries. In 2015, essentially her first year of racing, she won the Tour Divide and smashed the women's record by more than two days. The next year, she won the 4,400-mile Trans Am bike race and set the overall record for both men and women on the Baja Divide route in 2017. Today, Leo continues to race and co-leads a mentorship program for middle school girls called Grit Anchorage in her hometown. Thanks for joining us, Leo. Hey, thanks for having me. So that's a really long list of accomplishments for someone who's only been racing for six years or so. Did you imagine any of this uh, when you were growing up? Absolutely not. I wasn't a cyclist, but I guess as a kid, my real dream was to be a professional athlete. I wanted to be a basketball player or soccer player, go to the Olympics for something, but I never really saw riding a bike as a sport. So I think, you know, my kid self would be pretty surprised at what I'm doing, but also probably really excited. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. So, I mean, I guess you've always been a pretty competitive person. Were you competitive like in other sports that you tried out like prior to getting into cycling? Yeah, totally. I was like sports were my life. So I started playing. I started running when I was, I think, six or so. I ran with my dad, so I'd run like 10Ks. And uh, and then I got into basketball, and then I got into soccer, and that was like my whole focus. And I thought, you know, the extension of this is I'm going to play women's college soccer, and then I'm going to go to the Olympics. Wow. You know, I, I, uh, I kind of got out of soccer because everyone around me was just getting injured. You know, all these ACL tears, and I was like, I don't, I don't want to sit on the sidelines you know, and then I, I guess I realized my real passion was actually just moving, being outside, moving through space. And then if you do that as an individual, you don't have to plan around a team. You don't have to rely on others. You can kind of just do whatever you want with it. So then it, I started running and got really into that, ran a marathon right out of high school. And But I think, you know, I am competitive, but more than that, it's just, just being out there is, is kind of where you know, my, my heart is just spending the time outside moving. So it's like, if, if I'm in a race, that's great. I'll, I'll push it as hard as I can, but I'm also just happy doing it every day. Yeah. Huh. That's, yeah, that's really interesting. And I'm sure a lot of listeners can sort of relate to that as well. I mean, that's, that's kind of why we like mountain biking, right? Like getting outside and yeah, pushing ourselves and seeing new places. So what motivates you to sort of push yourself in training and in competition do you have like any mental tricks or things like that that you've learned over the years? I guess it's like a, so I get these big dreams or goals. I'm like, well, could I cover this distance? You know, and it might be a thousand miles. And then I think, well, could I do in this amount of time? And then it's a game of seeing if, you know, I could actually accomplish that. And then a lot of this racing, the racing I do is all self-supported in usually you know, at least 350 miles up to my longest race was 4,300 miles. So you're out there for days. So, I mean, a lot of it is like riding hard when you feel good, but then if you don't feel good, it's, you don't stop. You just keep moving forward and then kind of accepting where you're at at those different times. And then realizing, you know, as far as like the race goes, if, if you stop your average speed, totally drops off. But if you just continue at the best of your ability, you can really still keep making good ground until you feel good enough to, to ride fast again. So it's, it's definitely kind of a, it's a battle, but it's, it's so solo, you know, usually the racing, it's like, maybe I'll see somebody, you know, once a day, another racer. So for the most part, it's like, I'm out in these remote places with nobody around. And then, I mean, yeah, of course you have those questions like, why am I out the here? What am I doing? Especially if you're feeling pain or discomfort or you're really tired. But I mean, what's the, what's the alternative to just like sit on the side of the road, you know, and in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> yeah. You kind of don't have a choice. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, so and then also even thinking about that, dwelling on the negative, it's like, a, is that helping me? No. So it's like kind of you have to turn around your mental attitude towards what you're doing just to. And for me, generally, I'm I'm happy to be out there. I'm having fun. I'm seeing something new. Uh, but yeah, there are definitely those hard moments that you have to deal mm, with as well. Yeah. Well, it's interesting too that, you know, you say you started out in like basketball and soccer, which are, you know, very much team sports. And now to be doing something that is, you know, I mean, cycling is one thing, like racing bikes, uh, is, is a pretty solitary pursuit, but to do what you do to go on these like, you know, multi day, like, multi thousand mile bike races where, yeah, maybe you, you might see somebody once a day. You might not like, is that hard for you at all, uh, to make that transition? And, and also, I guess, I mean, are you, would you consider yourself an introvert or an extrovert? Totally. I think, you know, it's like I, at this point I spend so much time like talking with different people and being around groups that, uh, when I have like an opportunity to go out for a solo race, I'm, it's, it's almost like a relief because I'm like, oh, I can go out there and just kind of be alone with my thoughts and, and have this quiet, peaceful time for a week or whatever it'll be. So I guess it's it's kind of the balance, you know, and for having like a very social, a- active life involved with other people and then and then being out racing and it being quiet and alone. But I guess, you know, the good thing is I... I know that neither will last forever, so uh, I'm always looking forward to one or the other. Um, and that's the same with like the racing versus the travel. So it's like I do some of these races, but they're so physically hard on the body that I think you know I'll race like a maximum of three big races a year. But then beyond that, I'm like, well, what about all the other places I could just go ride? And then challenge myself in different ways. Like I'm not a great mountain biker, but I, but it's something that like I I like to take on because I can learn from it. Especially these long distance trails, like the Arizona Trail. It's like it's going to be brutally hard and challenging, and I don't have the best skills. But I feel like if I spend you know two weeks out there, I'll get so much better at riding. But it's nice to not always do that in a race setting, because it's you know then you can stop and have a snack on the side of the trail or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, do you have like a mantra when it is really, really tough or like, you know, you've got like a hundred miles across, like, you know, some flat, like wind swept plane and you're just not, not looking forward to it. And you just have to like get in the zone. What What's sort of like your mantra that you tell yourself? I mean, I think, you know, one of the things I think about is that it won't last forever. You know, things will change. You know, whether that's like the wind conditions or feet hurt or whatever it is, that it's like that that will change, that I'll come out on the other side of it feeling better or maybe just not attach so much feeling to it, like not get so frustrated. It's like, okay, I'm riding into a headwind, but that's just how it is, you know, and that's and then, yeah, I guess not getting like emotional about the conditions or the situation and I mean, now it's also like if if I'm doing that, I just put in some pop music and and try to think about something else. You know, I I didn't ride with music for years and I just started to, I think, about three years ago. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is so much easier. (laughs) It's amazing. I mean, I guess it's kind of like a drug, but it's just music. Yeah. Well, that's interesting, too. Yeah. I mean, is it like for a lot of people, um, music is really helpful and to, to not ride with music and then to like add that in is, have you found yourself like needing it more and more? You says like a drug, I mean, or, or are you able to limit it and be like just a couple hours and then like, I'm going to shut it off and, and enjoy it. Yeah. I mean, you get tired of it too. You know, it's like I'm riding for 20 hours a day, like, I'm like, okay, I'm tired of these songs. But then I've also started listening to audiobooks and that's super fun because I'll be like riding through the night like I did a race in Kyrgyzstan last last summer a uh, thousand miles and I was listening to Lonesome Dove yeah. it's Larry McMurtry cowboy western and then I'm riding through these like desolate landscapes and they're going through all these hardships and I'm like it kind of put me in the like mindset of like I can do this and it was like, it was so cool. And then Kyrgyzstan's nomadic. They're like, the only people I would see were like horsemen. And that like totally went with the book too. So that's also been something I've done just 
to be able to ride through the night, you know, to listen to a story. It'll keep like my mind more engaged where I won't be thinking so much about sleeping. Well, I'm curious to ask you, what are your thoughts on gender equality in sports, particularly endurance cycling? Do you think gender has a role to play in terms of performance at the highest level where you are? I really don't, particularly like the longer the races get. I feel like every individual comes with different, you know, strengths and weaknesses, but I don't think it's specifically a male-female division in that. You know, it's like you have to... For a self-supported race, you have to take care of your body, your equipment, uh, where you sleep, where, where you get food, and then and then kind of how you recover. I think maybe that's like the biggest issue is like how you physically recover day after day with limited sleep, uh, with such maximum exertion. And it's not it's not all about speed, but consistency. And I mean, in some ways, you're like I think well, women have an advantage that they don't have to consume as many calories. You know, I mean, it's like the amount of food we have to eat to be able to ride these distances is incredible. And it's like, and then, you know, if you don't fuel yourself enough, it's like you mentally and physically bonk and then you're not making good progress. But like for me, it's like, yeah, I have to eat a lot, but I rarely have that physical bonk. You know, it's like I can consistently move on by just like eating sandwiches or drinking milk or whatever. You know, it's like it's, I'm not... I, I think my body doesn't go quite as into starvation mode as some of these other racers do. But so, I mean, everybody kind of brings, you know, they're different. I guess your body is your vehicle. Like my biggest limitation is my breathing. I have asthma and especially when I'm pushing myself hard, it's like I, I just have trouble breathing. I'm always coughing. But other people, their, you know, their limits are, you know, their knees or their ability to cut sleep or whatever else. So I think... It's more of, you know, everybody's personally confronting their edge, but I don't think that that's necessarily like a, a man's going to, their edge is going to be farther than a woman's. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's different. Yeah, I mean, it almost sounds like, yeah, everybody's got sort of an edge or a thing that, that limits them. And gender sounds like, in your opinion, is not one of those things. I mean, it's it's fascinating, too, to see, especially in these ultra-endurance events, uh, women beating men's times, you know? I mean, you're seeing it in swimming and in other sports like that as well. And, yeah, it's it's really interesting because, I don't know, I mean, people didn't didn't know what was possible, right, before this and before, like, even what you've done. Right. And I think we'll continue to see it more and more just as more women participate. You know, like the the entries to these races at this point, it's like, you know, there might be a field of 180 only six of them are women, maybe 20 of them are women, you know? So it's like, there just aren't that many women involved racing, but, uh, as the, those numbers increase, then you're bound to have more women that are kind of pushing those limits and, and finding, you know, success. So I'm interested to see if this sport continues to grow in the next 20 years. I mean, maybe people will just decide nobody wants to do this anymore because it's just too brutal. But if it does continue to grow, just to see like if more women participate and feel like they have a level of support where, you know, they feel like they can accomplish, they can win, you know, because it's that's so much a part of it is like having the confidence that you can win, you know, even if you don't look as strong or as tough as you know, the guys you're lining up against, that, that actually doesn't matter. You know, it's like whoever gets to the end first wins. So I, I'm interested to see if, if you, more women continue to win. But I have seen it like a woman won a race across Europe last summer. A woman won a race across Australia. So it's, it's happening and not only in cycling, but running and swimming. So pretty exciting stuff for me. I never really thought about that either, that yeah, I mean, for a lot of people, myself included, I don't, I don't know if I would want to do a race if I felt from the beginning that I couldn't win it, right? And yeah, it seems like women probably feel that more intently than than men um, in a lot of these sports. But yeah, if 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 and when that changes, that seems like that could be huge. Totally. Yeah, I just think it's natural for like women to be questioned more, like. Or maybe not natural, but that's just kind of what's happening now. It's like, are you going to, you're doing this? Is that safe? You know, like there's, people are like planting these seeds of doubt. And it's like, 
and that's hard to deal with because, you know, it's like, for me, it's like, I'm used to trusting people and listening to their ideas. And then at some point you have to think, okay, I, I don't actually have to listen to that or believe it. <laughs> like I'm going to do what I'm going to do, you know? So what's the toughest part of an ultra endurance race like the tour divide? Oh, there's, I feel like every race, like I'm not sure what the challenge is going to be until I'm in it. Like the, my first run on the tour divide, I had horrible breathing problems and I ended up having to ride myself to the emergency room in Montana, like, you know, a week into the race or five days into the race. It was terrible. But then it's like every, every race, like the Trans Am, it was like record setting heat. So dealing with that was just physically, I just felt like I was frying. And then like my solution was if I ever saw like a little creek or a hose or any water, I would just like soak my entire body or I ju I'd jump in the creek with like all my clothes on and then just get back on my bike as quick as I could. And it was like, that was the only way I could cool down. So I feel like every, every place it's like something different. Like last year in Kyrgyzstan, there was a huge snowstorm on the first day, you know, and then it's, it snowed half the days for the rest of the race and it was really cold and the week before it had been like a hundred degrees so I wasn't expecting that change yeah so it's always something different and then I guess it's like it's all about finding you know the solution but I mean ultimately like the probably the worst part about it uh these long races is the lack of sleep it's just so <sighs> bad for you you know it's yeah so that's that's tough but it's also just part of part of it you know if you if you don't cut sleep you really won't be competing at the front of the race yeah is that something you've always been able to do like are you the kind of person that doesn't need a lot of sleep like in general or is that like a sort of a skill you discovered along the way I think it's I've always been kind of like that because even you know before I was racing I was working full-time and then I was like well I don't want to miss out on going for these rides or doing these other things so then I just wouldn't sleep much because I, I feel, I guess I feel like I always have a lot of energy. Like I, I don't want to miss out on, you know, the things I want to do. So I've always been like that. But then, you know, for a race, it's like pushing that to a farther limit. Like you, in regular life, it's like, you know, if you get really exhausted, you just sleep. But then for a race, you have to be like, okay, no, I can't sleep. And the way I'll do it is I'll usually sleep early. So I start getting tired like an hour after sunset. And then I'll just pull over on the side of the road and set an alarm for four hours and then wake up in the middle of the night and start riding again. That's the way I've found that's been mentally easiest to deal with yeah. with it. Because then I'm like, I'm not getting tired thinking, when am I going to sleep? You know, And then I start riding slower. I'm like, okay, I'll just sleep now. And that's another hard part is like, well, when you decide you're going to sleep, you have to kind of commit to it, <laughs> you know, because then I, I've had this thing where I'm like lying there. I'm like, I could still be riding, you know, and then you end up like set out your sleeping bag. You waste this time, like packing it back up and riding again. So now I'm like, I, I started this thing where I kind of just start like meditating when I'm going to rest. And then I'm like, OK, I'm going to be here for four hours and then I'll continue because then I know like ultimately I'll actually have better results if I get some physical rest. But yeah, it's, you get so excited that it's hard to kind of wind down. Hmm. Well, what's been like sort of the most concerning thing that you've experienced due to a lack of sleep during a race like that? I mean, so I did a, I, I did a time trial on the Arizona trail 300 where I didn't sleep at all. And the whole push was like 51 hours. <laughs> And then I just, I mean, I, I don't feel like I'm really hallucinating, but I'll start seeing like motion where there isn't any motion, like, uh, the rocks are moving or like, I'll see like a, uh, like a tree looks like a person or, you know, stuff like that. I guess that's like kind of weird because I'm like watching something. And then as I get closer, I'm like, is that an old lady? And then as I actually get up to it, I'm like, oh no, it's just a fence. <laughs> you know, something like that. That's probably the weirdest. I mean, I've also had like where he, I was just not able to like focus my eyes. It seemed like little kind of dots in front of my eyes. And then I was like, well, that's actually, 
I actually just pulled over and slept. Something like that. If I can't focus my eyes, that's getting pretty dangerous. Like I, you know, I slept for like an hour and then continued going. I I think I'm not willing to like push it into a danger zone, but you know, it does you do get start getting a little loopy? Right. Wow. So, how important is lightweight gear when you're doing a big race, especially one that's going to take you, you know, weeks? Um, are there like hacks that you've discovered to cut down on weight or do you try to like minimize the number of items that you need to carry? Oh, totally. Yeah. I, I am always trying to cut equipment, but then I've done that really to my detriment too. And, uh, like not brought a sleeping bag when I, I ended up just shaking on the ground, freezing, but yeah, I'm always looking for kind of the lightest solution, lightest and fastest. Mm -hmm. Uh, for like the gear that's going to stay on the bike. But then I've found, you know, sometimes bringing a little bit more as far as layers and things to provide warmth is actually in the end will make me go faster. Mm. Like the race in Kyrgyzstan, I brought a full down suit, down pants and a down jacket. And then I'd find myself like riding in, in the whole suit, which is really funny, (laughs) like riding in this, it's like the Michelin man. But uh, And I also brought like a little pair of sandals because there were so many stream crossings. So I'm like, well, if I don't get my feet wet and I'm not super cold, then uh, I'll actually in the end be faster for the race. So it's it's really just like a balance of looking at the specific race and then f- thinking about exactly what you need to accomplish that as fast as possible. So, you know, different races require a little bit of different gear, but um, I'm always trying to keep it pretty tight on the bike. Yeah. Well, what about the bike itself? Do you use the same bike for every race or is that something where you'll look at the course and say, you know, this, this bike might be a little better suited than another one that maybe you have access to? Totally. Yeah. Uh, different bikes, but you know, generally I'll go a little bit more towards like more comfort than I would typically use for the same terrain. Like for instance, the Tour Divide more or less is like a gravel route. But for that, I'll ride a hardtail mountain bike because I can fit a bigger tire and I have a suspension fork because over the time with the distance, you know, I'm riding, trying to ride about 200 miles a day. I just get more and more physically beat up. So having a more comfortable bike will actually help me both just feel better, but also ride faster. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, and then I'll outfit that bike with a different, things to make it more comfortable. Like I'll put an aero bar on the bike so I can take pressure off of my hands. I'll have ergon grips that with bar ends so I have different hand positions. Or last year I actually ran a drop bar. So it's it's about like being able to move around on the bike, uh, having a comfortable setup. And then, you know, for different terrain, a lot of it's just changing the gearing. Yeah. Like I did a time trial in Colombia in the spring or in February. And I was running a, you know, a 30 tooth chain ring with an Eagle cassette. It's like it's super, super easy gear, but I would find myself the the pitches are just so steep that I would just be like, you know, crawling at like three miles an hour up a hill, but that's still faster than walking. You know, I mean, some people would just get off and walk, but I feel like you waste time getting on and off the bike. So yeah, like the gearing will be essential, but yeah, it's, you know, the, the range of my riding is generally gravel bike to uh, full suspension. I mean, the biggest bike I've ridden is like a stump jumper. Um, and I rode that for a time trial on the Arizona Trail. It's a huge bike, but I just thought, well, you know, it's going to be hard. I might as well have some fun on the descents. <laughs> yeah, right on. So you, you mentioned how important fueling is during a big race attempt. So how tough though is nutrition during these, especially when they're self-supported races, you know, from everything that I've seen and the people I've talked to, you know, you, you really, you can only fuel at like gas stations a lot of times where you get food that's less than ideal. Do you think you could go even faster if you were able to eat a better diet? Yeah, I think I would go faster and be happier. 
but then I, I don't want to take the time to like sit at a restaurant and wait for, you know, somebody to cook food and have it ready to go. It's like, then I'm like sitting there looking at the clock. It's like half an hour goes by. I'm like, I could have been riding, you know, so, but then occasionally I'll have like, I'll take something to go and be like, oh my gosh, this is actually delicious. And it could be something that's like not even good. It's like a omelet from Denny's. Yeah. <laughs> it's like so much better than like a hot pocket, mm-hmm. you know? So, uh, yeah, I mean, gosh, I wish the food was better, but then I race in different countries, like racing in France or racing in Switzerland and the food just is better. You know, it's like you, there are bakeries in every small town with fresh baked goods, good sandwiches, you know, good milk. And so that, that's definitely a plus. But I guess, you know, it's looking at, well, what is available? What can I access quickly? And then finding food that, you know, a week into the race still looks somewhat appetizing because you get kind of tired of so much, so many sweets. So then it's even, even like finding a gas station that sells slices of pizza. It's like a little victory. You're like, oh yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, I imagine though you, you eat pretty healthily when you're training. And so is it hard to like make that transition from like, you know, I'm eating very good balanced diet, like leading up to the race. And then once it starts like hot dog, hot dog, hot dog, Mm -hmm. like, is that, (laughs) is that, I just can't imagine that that's good for racing overall too. Right. I mean, seems like people would be able to, to really maximize their potential if they were able to eat a proper diet. Totally. I think we just need to revolutionize the food available at the gas station. (laughs) That's all it would take. (laughs) We just need to go in and tell them, put our bike kits on and, you know, let them know. (laughs) But yeah, it would be a lot better if there was better food available. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you look at like the, the Tour de France or something, right? And, you know, every, every night, like their team sits down and they're able to like have a meal that's prepared by like probably, you know, a nutritionist has come up with the menu and everything is like totally optimized. Whereas like what you're doing is, you know, it seems, it seems really basic. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. But it's just, it's just not there, you know? So that's, you just have to kind of take what's available and, and use it, I guess. But yeah, I wish, I wish the food, the convenience food in America was better for sure. Well, you've been featured in a couple of documentary films. Most recently, I Just Want to Ride in 2019. And in that film, there was some controversy about whether having a film crew would give you an advantage in the race. But it seems like that could probably go both ways, right? So to me, like being on camera would be distracting and exhausting. So what did you learn from that experience and and will that change sort of how you approach media projects in the future? Right. Yeah, it was, it was surprising that there was controversy, that there was like a backlash to, to making a a film about the race. Mm -hmm. I mean, really our intention was just to share a positive story, to encourage others to kind of seek out their own adventures, Mm -hmm. push themselves, feel like, feel empowered that they could do it. And then for people to say, oh, it's cheating, or I I don't know. I mean, I also am a little skeptical of those claims because this is not the first film on that race. There have been like five others. But I don't think anybody else faced this kind of uh, controversy. So, I I mean, that's confusing, first of all. And then second, you know, the last three video projects we're taking on are are not about races just because it, it kind of made me think, well, you know, I, I don't want to fight these battles. I don't really want to like have to explain why I want to share this story. So why don't we share different stories? So the last one was about Anchorage Grit, the girls program I run. And then right now, Rue's editing one about a project we did in Columbia with bikepacking.com and Conservation International to establish a bikepacking route both to kind of invite people in to learn about Columbia, learn about conservation efforts there and, and, uh, make that a place people are interested in for bike adventure. And then the next video will be about, um, all the riding I'm doing in Alaska. So I'm like, well, if we, 
you know, let's, let's kind of change the story for now. Let's not focus on the racing. Let's focus on the adventure and, and share that and use that as a platform to encourage others and, and to share, share stories. So I, I'm kind of like, well, let's just take a break from the race stories right now, just because it was, it was emotionally hard to deal with. It's, it's hard, it's hard enough to complete these races, really hard to document them because they're so uh, remote. And also it's like, as a filmmaker, you, you only get one chance. It's like, you're out in the middle of the woods. Like you don't know where people are. There's no cell service. And then the racer comes by and it's like, well, if you were looking the other way, you would have missed it. You know, it's just really hard to capture. So, and then to have people trying to cause you problems in addition, it's like, this is impossible. We just don't have the time or energy to deal with that. So I think kind of focusing on different things beyond racing, at least for the time being is, is kind of how we're dealing with it. And then I'll go out and do the races myself but it's kind of sad if, if nobody's there to document it because it just, it's like I'm the only one who gets to experience that landscape, you know, instead of sharing that with others. So I, I'm a little sad about that, but it's just kind of how it is for now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people love those stories for sure. And, and there are, like you said, there are countless examples of films and documentaries that have been made, not just about the tour divide, but, you know, other races, Leadville comes to mind with race across the sky. And, um, yeah, it does seem like an, a double standard. And at the same time, if it were me, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't want to do one because it seems like, uh, yeah, it would just be exhausting and, and to try and like race and be in a film at the same time, like that, it just seems like that would be a, a big distraction. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if uh, I guess the allegations were that it was like giving me a emotional boost to do better. Uh, but yeah, at the same time, you're also like, well, I, I mean, I'm being filmed and I'm like, you know, I've been sleeping four hours a night and haven't showered for 10 days. Like, how good am I going to feel about how that looks? <laughs> Right, right. But it, People I mean, are like, hey, can you answer this question? Or like, hey, Leo, like, can just you ride like, by again and, and get a better shot? Out like, of my mind. Yeah. <laughs> Grabbing junk food at the gas station. You're like, oh, that looks good. But then I guess, you know, I've kind of come to a point where I'm like, whatever. If I'm doing it and someone, like, captures it, I don't care if they share that. It's fine. Because it does share, like, a real story. You know, it's like, well, and then people have these romantic notions of what it is to ride long distance. Like it's all, you know, it's beautiful sunrises and it's actually like ultimately pretty grimy. You know, you're like sleeping in a trash bag on the side of the road. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I'm, yeah, I want to continue sharing these stories because, uh, because there's also, yeah, there was a bit of backlash, but 99% positive feedback you know, and people writing me personal messages about how much it meant to them and inspired them to go take on a challenge that they never would have dreamed of and or like sharing these films with their daughters because it's so great to have a female role model to show them that they can do whatever they want. You know, it's like I've gotten so many good messages like that that, you know, definitely eh, I think as humans we focus on the negative a lot. It's just hard not to. Uh, but if I look at the big picture, it's like it, it really was well received and, and has, uh, has worked to create encouragement. Yeah. Well, the other thing that this brings to mind for me is that, you know, races like Tour Divide are, they're loosely organized and basically rely on like a gentleman's agreement for lack of a better term, which, you know, means that competitors are left to kind of figure out what the rules are and how they should be enforced and who should enforce them. You know, there's often not an entry fee or like anything. They try to keep it like low key, but at the same time, that, that causes some problems. So do you think having more formal rules and structure would be a good thing for ultra endurance racing or would that kill sort of the thing that makes it so special? I think a bit more structure would be great. Uh, I just specifically like leadership because that's the, that's the thing. It's like race to race. You kind of face a different situation every time. I mean, my favorite like race, the way it's organized is, uh, 
uh, in Switzerland. It's the Hope 1000, and the course is absolutely perfect. Like and the GPX track, there are no wrong turns from the setup, and then the race director like provides all the information of where every service is along the way. Like he's making it, and he's routed it so it goes by stores or bakeries or whatever, trying to make it like as straightforward as possible for racers to achieve this. Um, and the terrain is magnificent. Yeah, um, but it's also super hard. It's like a thousand kilometers with 30,000 meters of climbing. It's insane. You know, it's just so mountainous, but you know, for that, for it to have kind of this crystal clear setup of like the rules are that it's self-supported. You don't get help along the way, but everybody knows that, you know, there are seven bike shops along the way and go to them if you need something. And here are the hotels, here are, you know, all the restaurants, um, all the stores, you know, and like just making it like accessible for, for people to kind of take this challenge on and, and not, and then he's like, if somebody wants to come out and ride with you for, you know, 20 miles, like a local, that's fine. You know, it's like the, you're, you're encouraging them to, to see this terrain too. Uh, so I like that kind of approach where it's like, it, the thing is, the race is inspiring for people on different levels, whether they're participating or whether they're watching from the sidelines or coming out to ride with the racer. Like it, it feels like a very good community event. I feel like also like the folks with Dirty Kansas have done an excellent job kind of doing the same thing. You know, so I think like great leadership is definitely the way to go with this style of racing. And, you know, and uh, for me, it's like, I want to encourage more people to kind of take it on, you know, not necessarily just to be the best competitor, but to, to take on a challenge and, and ride a long distance. And I feel like, you know, a lot of this kind of the people saying like, Oh, it's grassroots is really, they're just trying to be exclusive to others and create, you know, strange rules that, you know, didn't exist from the outset to because they don't want to see change. Yeah. Yeah, that that is interesting. That it's it is grassroots, but it doesn't it it does feel exclusive in a lot of cases, and and maybe having standardized sort of rules and expectations about the events, yeah, could definitely open it up for more people. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, tell us about Anchorage Grit. What motivated you to start and lead this type of group? Oh yeah, I'm so excited about it. It's a uh... A girls riding mentorship program uh, that uh, GRIT stands for Girls Riding Into Tomorrow. And I started it in 2017 with a good friend of mine, Kate Rodriguez. And the main idea is we ride together for six weeks. We work with 12 and 13 year old low income students from Anchorage, where I grew up. And we build up to a 60 day or a 60 mile three day adventure ride, uh, starting from their school, going out to a forest service cabin on a Clutena Lake. It's basically the wilderness. It abuts up to a glacier. There's a stream coming through. It's really beautiful. Um, but you know, from the start, the, these girls really have never ridden more than five miles. Uh, so we start small, like our first ride's eight miles, and and then we build up from there. We ride together two or three times a week. Each ride is. Uh, to a lesson on some kind of skill that'll kind of help them with the final adventure, like first aid or fixing a flat. Or uh, we go to Revelate Designs um, where they help make their own bike packing bags. And uh, yeah, so it's it's super cool. Um, and then Specialized has sponsored the program and provided the bikes. Um, they're entry level mountain bikes. And then at the end, the girls uh, get to keep them. And then they can come back following years as student mentors and help the new set of girls. So this spring was supposed to be our fourth year of the program. Uh, we had to postpone it till next year uh, for coronavirus. But um, yeah, I'm still in touch with the girls and excited to continue with it. Uh, it's been really cool just to see them improve. You know, these girls get on the bikes. They they know how to ride, but barely, you know, they're super squirrely. They don't know how to shift. They're trying to use their feet as their brakes. And then to see them kind of get comfortable and confident and, and be able to ride proficiently and have fun with it. Um, and then do this final adventure. That's a huge challenge is, uh, it's really been cool to see and, and see them grow up. 
Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like a real challenge. I mean, for a lot of adults, they've never tried bike packing, and, you know, that feels like a really, really tough thing. And, and to have kids doing that is amazing because it seems like a lot of kids programs that we see are focused more around, uh, just, just basic bike skills or like, you know, perhaps even, even racing, but, um, yeah, bike packing that, that seems like a really ambitious thing. And it's cool to see that, that the girls are able to do it and, and the confidence that it gives them. Yeah. And it's also, it's not competitive. So it's like, you know, a lot of these girls are, are not very active uh, generally, but then for them to have an option of oh, you can be active and outside without having to race or be the fastest, just spending the time in, you know, it's also accessing nature. You know, we ride anchorages on the coast, but these girls go to school in East Anchorage. So it's like 10 miles away from the water and we ride out there together. And I mean, uh, at least half of them have never seen the water before and they're 13, you know? So it's like for them to realize, Hey, this, I could take this bike and take it out to different places and explore. Um, it's pretty cool. And then they get to keep the bike and it's going straight into their summer vacation and then they can ride with each other, you know, and they already know the trail system. It's, it's really cool to kind of empower them to do that, to leave their neighborhoods and, and just like it, see the beauty of it. Mm, yeah. Well, you're an inspiration to so many riders. Is there something you've always wanted to do, but haven't had a chance to do it yet? Mm, that's a good question. I mean, there are different trips I want to do, I guess. I've always wanted to ride in, in the country, Georgia, and I haven't made it there yet because it's kind of like Kyrgyzstan. It's very short season. There are mountains there that are over 20,000 feet, so you kind of have to go in the summer. But it looks just fantastic. It looks so beautiful. But other things, uh, yeah, I don't know. You know, I mean, with this uh, coronavirus, these limitations, I've been taking on different challenges. Like I tried to, been trying to learn how to wheelie. I've been trying to get better at mountain bike skills. You know, all these different little things. Wheelies are super important in bike packing. <laughs> <laughs> super important. But, you know, it's like even, I mean, now I'm 33. I'm like, wow, I'm actually, you, you get kind of s stuck in like what you're good at or what you do. You know, I'm great at riding long distance. I'm not good at mountain bike skills. So to work on that, that's, that's been good, you know, to kind of change my approach. But then is that something like I really love to do? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but yeah but you know it always feels good to be getting better uh to see improvement you know when when it seemed like something that was impossible i guess that's been really cool um but yeah no i'm I'm just excited on what i get to do and you know i think yeah i don't make plans more than six months out so then it's always about like well what do i urgently feel like the most excited about and then trying to pursue that. And I feel super fortunate that I get to do that. Mm, yeah. Are there people outside of cycling who really inspire you, who, who make you want to get better at what you do uh, because of what they do? Yeah. I mean, recently I've been like listening to uh, different biographies and autobiographies of, of uh, climbers and surfers. Um, and that's been, uh, cool to kind of hear their approach and then think about like, like those are such kind of technical sports. Um, but encouraging to me to like, you know, just try to keep improving and to like, listen to like the crazy feats that these people have done and, and also their connection to either, you know, their connection to the wall or their connection to the waves. It's like, that's, that's really cool to kind of like pursue that passion even though it like seems so niche it's like well that's your focus it doesn't have to be important to other people uh so that's that's been cool um to listen to and, and learn more about so I guess I'm I'm like you know I've, I love listening to stories from different adventure sports or even even mainstream sports it's like any of these documentaries like there's a new documentary out about Michael Jordan 
You know, it's like I used to watch all these ESPN 30 for 30s about different NBA players. And just to see the sheer athleticism of these guys is incredible. You know, it's like I I guess I don't follow sports generally, but I love like when it's a documentary story. And then I guess that's like inspires me to continue wanting to share my own story. So I'm like, well, that could be meaningful for somebody else. And then they could take it to another level if, if they wanted to. Yeah, that's cool. Well, you mentioned you're working on your wheelies, but what else are you doing this year because of coronavirus? Has your plan for training and competition had to shift a little bit? Last year, you were uh, hoping to break the Tour Divide record for this year, but it seems like maybe that's on hold. It might be because I think that, you know, the Canadian border is closed. So the race or the route starts in Banff. Um, so I think like technically I can't ride it right now. I guess we'll just see how that goes because I can always do a time trial. So the second time I rode it, I just rode by myself in August of 2015 to break my own record, uh, which was a really strange experience just to be totally out there alone for 15 days. Nobody else racing. I'm just racing the clock. So I, I consider doing that again if, if the border opens. Um, but otherwise, I came back to Alaska to continue a project from 2017 uh, where I rode all the roads in Alaska. And that was just like taking a paper map, looking where do these roads go. It's about half paved, half gravel. And then the goal was just to ride all of them and just see where they led and um you know, carrying a tent on my bike and, and riding. I was riding like 150 miles a day. And it's like there's endless daylight. So you can ride, you know, till 2 in the morning without lights, no problem. Uh, really fun, really cool to see tons of wild animals, you know, different little communities and uh, beautiful mountains. So I'm back this summer um, to document that, that project, uh, to rewrite some of the roads and then also ride a few island roads that I didn't get a chance to in 2017 and um, make a video about that project, uh, which is, is cool because oh, cool. I, I wouldn't be doing this otherwise. You know, I'd be focused on, I was going to do a time trial on the Oregon Outback, and then I was going to race the Tour Divide, and I had all these other plans. I was going to go to Europe, and now I'm like, okay, let's just simplify. Go back to Alaska, ride from there, you know, have it be more or less solo adventures, uh, and that's kind of seemed like one of the only options at this time to like continue adventure and share the story of riding from home. Um, but then I'm, I'm equally as excited about that as, as any of these other plans, you know? So I guess it's a unique opportunity to, to work on that. Yeah. Well, yeah, you certainly aren't sitting still. That's for sure. What, uh, you mentioned that uh, you still love just going out and riding for fun, uh, and not just competing. What are some of your like favorite trails to ride or like just places in the world to just get on a bike and, and ride? Oh yeah. Uh, I love the riding in Southern Arizona, tons of gravel roads. It's like South of Tucson, close to the Mexican border. I do some guiding down there too with the cyclist menu. Um, but I don't think I'd ever get sick of the riding there. Just incredible. Uh, where else, you know, it's like, I guess anytime I go for a race in different locations, I want to plan in either a ride to the start of that race or pre riding the route as a tour. Um, just extending, extending the adventure in some way. And then that also like feels like good training to prepare for the race. But it's like, I, I guess, you know, being able to connect these dots, like riding to the start, you know, it's like for me, then I feel like that allows more freedom because then I'm not stressed about racing or competing. I, I can take breaks. I can do what I want along the way, but also, you know, ride big miles and then sleep at night. Um, so I love those kind of little trips, especially when it's in a new place and it's, you know, unexpected terrain. Um, that's always fun. Uh, Yesterday I went out, or the day before yesterday, went out from Anchorage and then rode out to my parents' cabin. It's 80 miles away. It's a little A-frame cabin, no electricity, no water, running water. And that's always been like a, a place for me where, you know, even if I leave 
uh, later in the evening, um, just like having like a destination like that, getting in a big ride, sleeping in the cabin and then riding back the next day, you know, things like that. I, I don't think I'll ever get tired of. Yeah. Yeah. That's super cool. Do you ever get homesick though? Like, it sounds like you love just being out on the, on the road and, and exploring new places. Do you ever get tired of that and want to like go back home or, or if it were up to you, would you just like be nomadic? I think, you know, I used to actually live more off the bike before racing really. It was like traveling for six months and then being in one place for six months to work at a restaurant or a bike shop to save money. Uh, I really liked that, but now I feel like I get to do more different things. It's like I'm racing and then I'm traveling and then I'm running Anchorage Grit or I'm doing a, um, you know, a women's scholarship. Like I feel like I have more diverse projects going on and I, I like that better, you know, cause I, I, you know, it's like being out for a more extended trip. You question why you're out there if you're really like, Cause, because at some point it feels like kind of routine. You're like, okay, it, which sounds odd because it's like you're riding through a new new terrain, but you're like, okay, I'm going to wake up, I'm going to eat breakfast, probably going to ride you know, 80 miles, find somewhere else to sleep, and then I'll do it again and again. And that's, that's cool, but it's like, I, I don't know, I love having these projects to look forward to. Like, okay, in March I'm going to guide uh, gravel camps with the cyclist menu and then in april i'm going to go back to alaska and run acreage grit and then in you know end of may i'm going to race a dkxl and then you know like having more diversity i think is and then i have more to look forward to yeah yeah it makes you appreciate yeah the sort of being away from things helps you appreciate it so what would you be doing if you hadn't found cycling in 2008? Yeah, good question. I have no, I, I really liked uh, running and, and walking. So maybe I would have just pursued that more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Professional walker. <laughs> Adventure walker. You know, I think that exists. <laughs> oh, it's, it's great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe I'd just be on foot. You know, but I, I like it better on a bike. It's way easier to carry stuff. It's not so hard on your body. Mm. Right. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, Leo, thanks so much for sharing your story with us and, and for really inspiring uh, everybody who, who hears your story. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. It's been great talking with you. Well, you can follow and connect with Lael on Instagram at Lael Wilcox, and we'll have a link to that in the show notes. That's all we've got this week. We'll talk to you again next week.